Welcome everybody to the third episode of Unpacking Software from Chocolatey Software. On the third Thursday of each month at 5pm UTC or 4pm UTC as it is now, uh, we will be live chatting about the latest news and opinion on the world of software, focusing on packaging, software deployment and life cycle management. We have another live stream on the first Thursday of each month called Product Spotlight. Um, and this is where we uh, spotlight chocolate products, discuss releases, highlight features, and walk through tutorials and demos. Um, to ensure that you're notified of all the great content from Chocolatey Software, ensure you join our community hub on Discord, subscribe to us on YouTube, or follow us on Twitter or X, Mastodon, LinkedIn, Facebook, Blue Sky, and Twitch. You can find all of those links on our homepage, chocolatey.org. Just scroll all the way to the bottom and you'll find them there or in the description of where you found this content. We want to make sure we hear from you about the content that we are producing. Is it what you want to hear and see? Do you have any ideas of what you'd like to see? Have your say at uh, ch0.co slash stream survey. That's ch0.co slash stream survey, all one word. We'll pop that link up onto the screen shortly. Uh, my name is Paul Broadworth and I'm the Technical Engineering Manager here at Chocolatey Software and today I'm joined by Gary Ewan Park and Stephen Waldinger and I'm just going to bring them on now. S Gary, your screen went black there, you worried me, don't do that. That gives me concerns. I'm here. I'm uh, here. <laughs> cool. Um, Gary, do you want to introduce yourself first? Uh, sure, yes. Uh, my name is uh, Gary Ewan Park. I am a principal software engineer here at Chocolatey. Uh, I work remotely from my garage in Scotland, and I have been doing that for a good number of years now. And I am working on all the different parts of Chocolatey, not just uh, Chocolatey CL. Cool. Thanks, Gary. Stevie, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Stephen Vandinger, uh, customer solutions manager here at Chocolatey, and I fix all of our customers' problems along with the rest of my team. Uh, I also implement solutions for them as well, uh, along with my team when they have interesting projects that they want us to do. So it's a lot of fun. Really enjoy it. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Stevie. Um, so today we've got a few news items we're going to look at. Um, a number of package-related items, which is quite interesting. That's you know, the last couple of episodes, there hasn't been so much of that. Um, but we've certainly found um, a couple or a couple of it have come up in the last month. Um, but the first one I want to talk about is JetBrains. Um, we talked about that in previous episodes, um, where JetBrains um, and uh, Rapid7 had a bit of a, a falling out, let's say, um, over uh, the, a release that JetBrains had done. You can go back in. I think it was episode one or two. I'm not really sure when we picked it up, but you can have a look at the blog post and you'll find the link. You'll find the episode. You can go and read about that and listen to it. But anyway, so apparently they have released another uh, fix for 26 security problems. And uh, the security bu bulletin that they released later on had seven CVEs in there. But there's another bit of a problem in that they released the, the, the fixes, but with no information initially. And it's all, I think, really to do with this Rapid7 uh, spats. It's, Gary, did you, uh, do you have anything to, to say? Because, you know, we talked about this before, and I think that you had a few comments on this. It's a, it's a hard one. I mean, I, I, can, I guess it's, it's, it's the age-old thing. I can see both sides, right? And it depends. It's the, the kind of token answer. It's, I think I can understand where JetBrains is coming from. So JetBrains have identified a... a 26 problems in their uh, team city software. They want to get that out to their customers and people that are using it without putting their customers at risk by telling it the whole world about what the problems are. So I think I, I get that. I can understand that. And I actually appreciate that. Um, now I know our ops people, uh, I, think, I think it was mentioned last time that we use team city, but the, our ops team were on the ball and got our uh, systems updated without a problem. But other people in the Rapid7 issue were left in a pickle because people took over their systems and they had ransomware attacks going in and all sorts of stuff. So that came about because the information about how to uh, ex exploit the, the, the things was released before the patch was. So I'm, I think I'm with JetBrains on this one, to be honest. I, I, 
I don't think they're trying to be secretive. They are giving the, the full information at a point in time where they think it's appropriate. Now, is that two or three days after the, the, the fix has gone out? I think I'm okay with that. That's just me, though. I, I'm not an ops person. I don't understand ops, but that's how I see the world. Well, they, to just give some more information on those dates, I'm just reading there that um, they, they released the the patch uh, and there's the release notes on the 27th of March and I couldn't find out when exactly the security bullet went out detailing mm. the issues but um, the Wayback Machine had it uh, catalogued on the 2nd of April so sometime between the 27th of March and the 2nd of April which is what five six days yeah. they had released the security bullet I, I kind of feel that might be reasonable Stevie would if you get any thoughts on that I'm going to side with Jeff Rains on this one. Um, I, I really agree that putting the instruction manual out before the patch was released was a mistake. Uh, and they had customers impacted. Like, that. there's proof that, hey, this was a bad move. We've got customers that are impacted by, by that decision. So them keeping these 26 things close to or closer to the cuff, I'd do the same thing. Right. If I was in their position, I absolutely would. Um, I yeah, thought it was an I'd... interesting addition that they've made, though, to Team City, where it will pre-download yeah. new updates that are coming through. It doesn't install it. You, the, yeah. An ops person still has to come along and push a button to say, do the install, but it's just one less thing you have to wait for. So the, the download of that thing's already been done, so you can just hit go. Um, I thought that yeah. was a, a nice improvement and it makes sense. So. Yeah, that functionality came out of the ba- on the back of the last round of CVs yeah. um, that, that came out that, that started this whole kerfuffle with Rapid7 and all, all of that. So yeah, that's a welcome change for sure. I think I'd, I'd kind of agree. Um, I, this is the thing, if you depend on what you read, you've got security professionals saying, no, no. You must tell people exactly what it is. And then you've got people who work in the software area and say, well, then, as you mentioned, uh, Stevie, you're giving people the instruction manual on how yeah. to actually exploit these things. And from an operations perspective, where I spent a, a lot of my career, just because a release has been made doesn't mean you can update immediately. There are all sorts yeah. of complex systems out there and pipelines and, and all these things. You just can't immediately yeah. push a button and if it goes well, you've got to test. You've got to make sure you know you can potentially get a change board approval maybe it's emergency or whatever there's just lots and lots of red tape and hoops to jump through in some organizations yeah. because of this so you can't just install a patch and then hopefully um rapid sevens release of the instruction it comes out after you've installed that patch and you're all great um i haven't dug into it too deeply but i'm i don't know how rapid seven has come off in this um with regards to you know the attention that we've yeah. got potentially it's it's damaged um, the trust that, that Rapid7 may well have. I'm not saying it has, I haven't dug into it, but that's potential, a potential problem there. Um, you know, as a security uh, vendor, their, you know, their whole business is built on trust and doing something like this, especially when we talked about the last time, it sounded very much like they were unhappy with the way that uh, JetBrains done it, so just did it anyway in case you know, JetBrains was stealing their thunder. I think that was what, what said in one article. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, I don't know there, but I, I yeah. kind of, yeah, I agree that I think JetBrains did, and it, they stuck to their guns, they done it, you know, the, what they did last time, they did it again now, so they're saying this is the way we're doing things, we appreciate you don't like it, but this is yeah. it, and this is the reason. I think that, yeah, exactly, they, they have a process and they're following their process, and they've done yeah. it the same way that in both of these incidents, so can't fault them for that. Yep, and they've probably done it this way for a long time, and it's gone unnoticed. There's just added scrutiny now because of what happened last mm. time. Like, because uh, we all know that there are literally bots that sit around and look at GitHub repositories that scan for this stuff. And as soon as something comes out, it's garbled up. Like, it, yeah. it's out there. It, it's published. There's There's stuff on it. So... Keeping it really, really tight lipped and close close to the cuff, that's kind of a smarter play in my opinion. No, I agree. I agree. They they have not kept anybody in the dark. 
They just yeah. haven't published the deep details until yeah. later on. Giving exactly. people five, six days to patch their systems, I think exactly. is perfectly reasonable. Yeah. Really yeah. do. Time for a cab, um, all those things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because yeah. yeah. you might have really, really busy build infrastructure, right? Like, mm -hmm. there might not be a great time for you to patch, like, right away. You've got builds running. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Maybe, maybe you could do Windows could be hard to come by. Yeah. No, I agree. agree. Um, so, hopefully that spat that Rapid7 and JetBrains had can disappear into the yeah. the ether and both can maybe learn, take some lessons from it. Yeah, I um, think would it'll be the, get better. Yeah, no, no, I agree. I agree. Um, okay, let's let's move on. Uh, the other a couple of issues I mentioned at the beginning, um, actually, while I'm, I'm remembering, I'm just going to put the live stream feedback uh, link onto... Uh, the screen there, you, you'll see it. Um, if you're listening to us on a podcast, we'll have that in the description. Um, but please uh, give us feedback. If you let us know what uh, you like format-wise or you don't like format-wise or content that you would like to see or maybe the length. We're going to talk a little bit about the length of content uh, later on. But any feedback is appreciated. It only takes 10 seconds. Um, I think there's one mandatory button, and that's rate the 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 actual stream itself or the podcast and then give us some information is optional so you're literally taking 10 seconds and we really do appreciate it um okay um so yeah as i mentioned at the beginning there was a couple of package related issues this this uh, month um i'm going to we're going to talk about python for the first two i think um but there was all, over 170,000 users caught up in poisoned package ruse and um, this was an actual an article from the register um, that I found really interesting. Um, and it's to do with top.gg. Um, they they are a, uh, they host, or, or, they, they, they work with Discord bots. So I think that they provide a library, a Python SDK to allow you to work with Discord. They also do other SDKs, but we're concentrating on the Python one just now. Um, and they had um, malware basically um, in their and the, the the SDK that they provide, and um, one of the maintainers had been compromised. One of the devs had been compromised, and um, some commits were made that uh, introduced this malware. Um, now that's that's been reversed now, um, but it seems to be that two FA would have prevented this. Just again, reading the, the we'll provide the details for this, but reading between the lines, it gets a GitHub issue. There's some Discord comments. There's an explanation from the dev, but it sounded like two FA. Would have prevented this so you know two fa you know all your things there um that just i i'm thinking that today this is we just need to do especially when you're a dev on an sdk like that but um gary being a developer what what are your thoughts on this i mean yeah i mean from, from my point of view uh it is it's two fa all the things it is uh taking ownership and signing your git commit so that you kind of know that it's you uh so there's both github and gitlab have and probably the other um, hosting services as well. They allow you to um, use a GPG key or an SSH key to sign your uh, Git commits, and mm -hmm. people can know who you are. Uh, so there's that side to it, and 2FA, all the things. I think we've enabled a requirement of 2FA on all of our organizations now that we have on GitHub. Um, it's just par for the course now. It's kind of expected, um, and I would be reluctant to put my name to something if those kind of um, uh, features or uh, fallbacks weren't in place. Um, but this particular one, I mean, it, it reading through this article, it just struck me how much time and effort and building blocks go into this sort of thing because they had to pre-register a domain, they let it sit there for a little bit, and then they slipped mm -hmm. in the usage of that domain, which looked really close to the other ones that the, the standard user was using. It was just very, very clever, very, very scary. Um, and yeah, just, it's sad that it comes to this, but I mean, in this sort of scenario, you're always on the losing side because you only they they only have to win once, and you have to win. What is it they say? You have to defenders have to win all the time when the attackers only have to win once. Whatever the uh, analogy is, yeah. it's it's keeping up with all these things and the different scenarios that you can get yourself into. It's it's a scary world that we live in. At the end of the day, it really is. 
Yes, Stevie, do you like what <laughs> living in this scary world? <laughs> not, not particularly. But, but this does, this kind of highlights some things that are going on in the industry right now, um, particularly around software bill of materials, S bombs, and things like that, and you know, supply chain vulnerabilities and security and all this stuff, and maintaining that trust with all of your dependencies and things like that. So I, I think this is really pertinent to that conversation as well. Um, you've got, you know, major players in, in the software delivery industry, like, you know, Artifactory and Sonotype and CloudSmith. CloudSmith and Sonotype just recently started to do a lot more with SBOM type stuff. Uh, Sonotype just released a whole new SBOM manager product, in fact, mm. um, and CloudSmith has had one, uh, I, I think, for a little while now, um, but they allow you to do those sorts of things where you're shipping SBOMs with with your artifacts, with with those packages that you produce, um, mm. you know, and then adding further layers to things, being able to sign those packages, et cetera, et cetera. That's just another layer of trust that you can provide. But with an attack like this Python thing, that was well before any of that would have happened. Like, mm. that was packaged up. It would have been included. It would have been signed. It would have been part of that F-bomb. Like, you can't really fix that. So it's still mm. a problem. But it does highlight the need for test every little thing. You know, add some unit tests around all the URLs that you're expecting to use and only ship those known good URLs. Mm. So, like, there's all these tiny little things that, again, to Gary's point, the, we have to be on the defense all the freaking time and attackers only need to win once. We have to think of that stuff all mm. the freaking time because attackers are. They're like, oh, I bet they're not testing for this. Let's go after it. And sure enough, <laughs> they're not. <laughs> and and, and they get in. So it's a huge problem. Anybody yeah, who yeah. says software development is easy is wrong. <laughs> the attackers are also relentless. Um, yes. You know, they, they, they will just keep, if that this doesn't work, they'll try another, and it'll only be a slight deviation, then another slight deviation. They'll just keep trying, because you can automate all of this today. We've got AI that can, uh, you know, look at some of this and give better ex uh, examples and try things. And it, it, The world is a scary place, and it feels like the, the foot is slowly moving over to the attacker's side. Now, it's a bit like a pendulum, I think. It never really sits in the middle. It's always one side or the other. And I think at the moment, just judging by the amount that is going on, attackers are getting the upper hand. But, you know, it will be a case where it will swing back the other way and um, the, the uh, defenders will get the upper hand for a bit as well. Sure. But it, it is a scary world. Um, it, just to, to, to finish off there, I've just looked at it, if anybody's interested. Malware infected packages were distributed between 19th of February and the 3rd of March. So if you use that SDK between those dates, um, then you know you might you potentially will have a problem. The other thing is that the compromised developer, however the explanation was, and people did accept it in the GitHub um, issue that I was looking at, he did step down and is no longer part of uh, the organization. So that that's kind of cost him. I, I'm sure it wasn't a paid job. I'm sure it was something he just helped to contribute to. But still, it's cost him that, that, that um, part of you know what he was interested in and what he was working on so 2fa all your things kids that's basically i think the the lesson mm -hmm. from that one um and again sticking with uh pi pi um they suspended new user registrations to block a malware campaign this is the second time this has happened it happened last year at roughly the same thing i think it was march last year um this happened so they suspended uh new registrations after packages were being uploaded with names to mimic legitimate products, so a project, sorry. Um, so, you know, very, very similar naming and people just need to typo something and off they go and they're getting some sort of malware infected um, package being uh, downloaded and, and used within their the product, within their project, whatever it is. Um, it was a total of 500 packages and accounts that there were, so they apparently they were uh, each new maintainer 
uh, was only uploading one package. So that again, that's if you if you had five hundred uh, projects suddenly being uploaded by one maintainer, that hopefully flags some problems. But they're now saying, well, let's just do five hundred accounts and then we'll do one package each. And that does that's not going to flag anything. Yeah. Um. So yeah, the, the encrypted code in the the projects that uh, downloaded a payload from server and when it was used, it stole passwords and uh, cookies and crypto extensions um, from web browsers. So a big problem, um, I think. G Gary, somebody who works on the chocolate community repository a lot on the kind of package moderation services side, I mean, how is, how are, how is chocolate covered for that? I mean, chocolate does it or chocolatey as an ecosystem we 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 try our very best to uh, limit the exposure to this type of thing so the chocolate community repository um it wouldn't allow an influx of 500 packages because if a new user comes along and creates a, an account they would only ever be able to push uh one package version for each package that they're trying to push they wouldn't be able to, to flood it with uh, hundreds uh, of package versions and we do that specifically for a reason to prevent um, things like this. We want to know that that new maintainer coming along is doing things right. There's a human interaction. It goes through, well, our package goes through all of the automated package moderation services, but there's a human element to it as well, where we can provide guidance and suggestions on how a package uh, is being created. Um, and I've said this before, but um, package moderation on the chocolate community repository uh, which paul's just linked to as a blog post uh, or in our back to basics series uh, about what the chocolate community repository is uh, you can go and have a look at that I, I've, I've said this before package moderation is the best thing about the chocolate community repository and it's also the worst thing about the chocolate community repository because because we have that human element because we have that due diligence of making sure that packages are up to a certain level and not trying to do something malicious, then sometimes the package moderation queue gets long and the packages take a while to get moderated. But I still, to this day, I still feel that that's better than potentially letting a malicious package through from a, a malicious maintainer. Um, so yeah, I, I feel for the PyPy community, I really do. And having to do this, again, it's one of these things that it's a community driven effort. They're trying to do the, the, good stuff for everyone in the um in the community and then malicious actors come along and 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 do naughty words all over it um so <laughs> i won't say the naughty words um but yeah it, it's, it's again it's a horrible situation we, we we live in this world where people take advantage of all these things so yeah i feel for them i really do this is why we can't have nice things exactly <laughs> exactly um yeah stevie any thoughts on that yeah. uh well, uh, again, we have a really robust patch package moderation services, but still trust but verify those things. Yeah. Like if you're going to consume something, especially a chocolatey package that under the hood executes PowerShell code, um, read the script. It's all there. Like we provide all the code that that package is going to run on the page for that package. So you have the ability to go in there and read it for yourself. Hey, when I execute this package, this is what's going to happen. Um, we've never had an instance that I know of, of malicious stuff landing like this uh, PyPy thing on our community repository, but there's not to say it ever couldn't. Because again, there's a human element to what we do here and humans are inherently fallible. So one of us that moderates packages could make a mistake someday and let something slip through that probably shouldn't have. Um, but, but yeah, I, as with everything, trust but verify. Like, put your tinfoil hat on. There's no, no SLAs or guarantees with a package on the community repository. No. Um, but a good point there is that, you know, the scripts are not only viewable on a package page. If you uh, run chocolatey cli it will ask you to if you want to run the script and you can view it uh, in the console as well before you run it yeah. so that is an option you can turn that off and it will automatically do it but if you haven't done that then yeah. you still get that option but yeah always 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 look at what you're running um and see it. and the, the PowerShell in the vast majority of packages is fairly straightforward 
and yeah. it's not you've got some complicated packages like the java one and there's reasons for that but most sure. packages are fairly yeah fairly straightforward. the adobe reader ones that is quite complicated as well yeah uh, just I because st- i'm that one and, and things yeah. Yeah. yeah um but yeah to, don't look at the java one if you want not want a partial nightmares um okay uh to, moving on to the next one then this is our third dinner package issues of the month maybe we should have some sort of banner that says package issues of the month um this one is about uh, ai hallucinating software package names and devs downloading them and or putting them into their projects so a little bit similar to the other one but this is more this is a little it's not tongue-in-cheek it's funny but it's not funny good um, yeah. there's, this is obviously a problem, but so, um, a security researcher actually started asking, um, AI chatbots about, uh, various developer related questions and, and it was returning packages that could solve those problems. Um, and those package names tended to be not correct and were made up. So the questions were kind of asked in different ways and this researcher tried to get the, uh, uh, the package names that are being repeated most frequently and then created some packages to match those names so that they could determine if people were actually using these sorts of chatbots to get packages that they've made up um, and actually add them into their projects. And yes, they did. Um, 15,000 downloads of one particular package that they created called Hugging Face-CLI. Uh, Alibaba actually used it in their project uh, or one of the projects, um, and actually provided instructions in how to install it. So, um, yeah, I, I the actual package that should have been suggested was Hugging Face underscore Hub, but the AI suggested Hugging Face that CLI. There was many questions and many packages. This the article that we're we're going to link to is uh, talking about this one in particular. But it, I have no words of why you would trust <laughs> a, AI. I I I, ju- I just I just don't know why. Uh, yeah, AI is not. It's not AI is not artificial intelligence. It's a language model that that is queried, and you know. Yeah. So it's it's been given information by, as you mentioned, Stevie, as flawed humans, um, and then we're expecting it to produce some sort of intelligible results, which is mm. clearly not in all cases. Um, but yeah, what what are your thoughts on that, Stevie? So I don't use AI without swear write- words. Code. Yeah, yeah. I'll try real hard. I don't use the AI to write code. I, I, I just don't. I don't trust it to, to write code. Um, now, I, I I will say that I'll, I'll use it to, like, figure out, like, a concept for code, but I won't just blindly copy and paste what it gives me into a script and then ru- run it. I, like, I'll cherry pick stuff out of a piece of code that it gets me or whatever but the vast majority of my ai use is wordsmithing things that i want to like make into a blog post or Mm. put as something to do with a product that we're working on or whatever like i use it to make me write more gooder (laughs) because i'm not very good at it on my own sometimes um but yeah the, the whole code thing those language models are injects ingesting code from all over the place from github or wherever they can publicly get at the code right they they ingest that code and let's face it um as a developer myself i don't write good code <laughs> so somebody else that wants to use it uh good luck <laughs> I, I i just uh, i don't know i it's not there yet it's not there yet i think we've got a long way to go before we get to the level of panic that people are at with AI taking jobs and things like that, we're, it's not going to happen for a while. Yeah, I, I no, I completely agree. I think um, uh, Corey, just to sum up, it's not a tool that's replacing another, but a tool to complement the other. Um, Gary, mm-hmm. do you use AI for your? Co- I've, I've seen your code, um, so I <laughs> know. <laughs> that you use in fact you don't do any work you just purely use ai so so i don't actually i've 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 toyed with it i I know what it is i know what it can do but i don't personally use it mainly because the main reason for that is because some of the code i work with is in private repositories and there's ip associated with it so i've never wanted to 
quote unquote trust um, some of these uh, AI um, systems to not take that code and, and, and use it elsewhere. So I've kind of made a stance to say that I'm, I'm not going to use it and not get into the habit of using it. Um, but the main thing from all of this, so this, the thing that I take away from this is not necessarily the AI and the lang, lang, large language models, because that's a whole discussion that we can get into and there's going to be both sides on all of it. The thing that really got me is that there was a really clever, and by clever, I mean evil dude out there who saw there's a potential exploit in this system by it hallucinating a package name, him then going off and making that package a thing so that it would start using it and people would start using it. That's the level of a low level sneaky stuff that we have to contend with. And the jobs that we have are up against people who think like this. I personally would never have thought of that as a, a, a as an attack vector, but someone did. And that, again, I go back to the scary world that we live in. We should all just become farmers or something and do away with all Hermits this technology the stuff. Just go Hermits back. Yeah. The woods, let's, man. Yeah. Let's, let's just turn them all off and yeah. just go and farm the land and be done with it. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's it was a very interesting article to read. Um, scary, evil dude doing stuff that just highlight it's incredibly clever future Let, let's aspect. let's be honest at, at the end of the day it's freaking clever yeah i agree what they did like yeah. <laughs> like it's it's awesome now if only we could do that with like lottery numbers or something I mean... <laughs> something useful we're not allowed yeah. to call them evil dudes anymore gary they're called security researchers security yeah. researchers that's the one yes, that's, yeah that's that the evil dude over there in the corner yeah i'm looking at you yeah <laughs> oh but uh, but yeah, yeah I, can, I, I don't do so much code these days, but I don't use um, any of the AI to, to generate code. Whenever I have done, because there's a lot of people, especially at the beginning, were saying, oh, it's done this, it's great with code. And so I tried and everything that produced was wrong. Um, so it was actually causing me, costing me more time to keep asking it to refine things yeah. and saying things were wrong than actually just looking up for myself. Yeah. Um, so I just stopped using it. Yeah. I had a conversation with, some folks at PowerShell Summit last week in Bellevue about that very thing. It's like, yeah, AI can get you 80% of the way there towards something, but that last 20% is going to cost you how much time? Hmm. Like, it could take you in a direction that you really know nothing about, and that 20% is so much time compared to just organically figuring out things on your own. You know? Through more traditional methods like Google and Stack Overflow. <laughs> some, it's actually something that we forgot to bring up um, that um, Unsolacit, hopefully I've pronounced that wrong, in chat mentioned was there was issues with Snapcraft, Snapcraft packages as well, malicious packages. Um, and, you know, the, the solution or part of the solution there was they absolutely need human moderation there. I remember reading about that. I use Linux a lot. Um, I'm not a, saf, a snap. I can't even say it. Why would I use it? A snap craft user. Um, but, I, you know, I, I remember reading about this and the problems they were having. We didn't include that. That was my bad. But, um, yeah, another example of, you know, a place where packages are a repository or a place that packages are being stored and, and the issues that they were having. Um and Corey also mentioned you can tell how long someone has been in technology by how much they just want to leave society for a cabin in the woods. So Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. I'm ready to go. <laughs> just tell me when I can go, Paul. I've got it. Okay. I'm ready. Um, in about 10 minutes, Gary, probably 15 yes. minutes you can go. That's fine. <laughs> um, okay, so we've got some security news, which uh, we're going to go through uh, kind of fairly quickly. Um Putty has vulnerabilities in versions below 0 0.80. So um, if you've ever used Putty for your keys, for sorry, if you've ever used Putty and used it with um, any keys, that, that private key could be compromised, could be recovered in certain circumstances. So again, we'll provide the details for that. We're kind of running through it um, a little bit quickly. But um, yeah, it's not just keys that it's generated, it's keys that it has used. So that might be lots and lots and lots of people. Um, well, uh, the next one I want to kind of pick up with both of you just to see what your thoughts are. But um, th this this 
headlines a little bit misleading, but it's correct. It depends where you sit where you sit on the fence. Microsoft is silently installing Copilot onto Windows Server 2022. Now they're not actually installing Copilot. It seems to be some sort of stub for Copilot that they're installing there, and it also looks to be a mistake. Um, with the, the 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 link that we'll provide in the description, um, it does say it will be removed from devices where Microsoft Copilot is not intended to be enabled or installed. This includes most Windows Server devices. What does most mean? I would imagine it would be all. Ser- Why do you need Copilot on a server, um, Stevie? What you you were kind of looking at this um, earlier? <laughs> I didn't it believe it up. at first. No, I me mean, neither. I didn't believe it, and I didn't actually. I was looking in the wrong place. Like this is an AppX package, so it doesn't show up in traditional programs and features. So when it was initially brought to my attention, I'm like, no, <laughs> it's it's not here. My my box is fully patched, and I checked for Windows updates again. When so because I actually got a Defender antivirus definition update at that point, but yeah, it, it wasn't there. It. But if you go to like the the new modern settings apps thingy, it, it's there. Um, mm. it, that's it, actually it, what it's called, it, it Stevie. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the modern Windows app settings thingy is the, that's yeah. the name of it. I, I so. thought I had it right. I thought I had it right. But, but yeah, I was floored. I'm like, wh- why? So I I was actually relieved to hear that it was a, a boo boo, which kind of sucks for other reasons, but it's because it seems like Microsoft is treating everybody as their green field for testing updates, but that's a whole another conversation in and of itself. That's a special episode. Um, We'll talk about that. But yeah, it it does look like it's an update, but we did prove it, so we're not just reading this and we're we're taking the headlines gospel. We actually, two or three of us, did they actually go in and prove yeah. this? Not me. I ended up not doing it, but um, yeah. a couple. I've of got the screenshots there. to prove it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I says James as well managed to get yeah. it, and I, I think Corey might have done as well. So you know, another team had managed to prove this out. Um, Gary, what are your thoughts on uh, AI in Windows Server twenty twenty two? I mean, it. I think in this particular instance, I think you you called it right. I think I think this was a mistake. It wasn't a necessarily malicious act. They weren't intending to do this. It was done by. Um, mistake, but it does open up the, the the larger question is that Windows Update Service is for performing updates uh, by default, and that's what you want it to do. But this is more feeling like a it's trying to deploy some sort of new feature. To me, yeah. that that's an opt in that 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 needs to be given the go ahead, the green light by system administrator, administrator on the machine, uh, just having that appear and start doing stuff unbeknownst to people. That feels wrong. Um, and needs to be, yeah, that, that sort of stuff can't happen because I wouldn't expect that sort of thing to come necessarily through uh, my Windows Update service. But again, yeah. it's maybe just my take on it. I think it came as part of a, a Microsoft Edge update, was it? Was it not? They but then, but then, then that steps and, into, well, did it, but... yes, it's an Edge update, but what's that got to do with Copilot? Exactly. And, oh, yeah, it, I, I 100% yeah, agree. But, but yeah, it was an, an update to Edge is the entry point for yeah. it. <clears throat> that's uh, that's another special episode with uh, called Browsers on Windows Server <laughs> and why you shouldn't use them. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I know Edge has a lot of components yeah. in the background. It's not yes. Edge is not just the browser, but still like yeah i think all the points for that i think more importantly the the windows update service we're expecting it to play patches fix things security holes being plugged we're not expecting ai features to be deployed to a system whether that's a server or personally whether it's a client machine that for me is opt-in as you said gary that's not an opt-out feature and i don't think the windows update service should ever be used for something like that um but again uh, who am i um okay so we're that's that's the kind of security news and we're we're over time a little bit and that's something we're going to come to at the end we're going to have a quick chat about i just want to talk a little bit about patch tuesday which is traditionally the second tuesday of each month there's not a lot this month we're probably going to not continue to have this section um in the the stream in the podcast because there's not really a lot to talk about we always get to the end and kind of rush through it so um and there's plenty of other resources you can get it from so but microsoft has patched 157 vulnerabilities uh this patch tuesday including 149 CVEs. That may be normal, I'll be honest, 149 CVEs, but that number seems incredibly huge to me. Um, 
there's also an exploit for Outlook for Windows that can steal the user's password if they simply click on a malicious link. So, yeah, win for that. Um, Adobe patches nine vulnerabilities in uh, Adobe Commerce, Magento Open Source, Adobe Experience Manager, meaning Coda, After Effects, Photoshop, and InDesign. There seems to be a constant cycle for Adobe patching really critical uh, vulnerabilities. Um, so yeah, just to run through that. And we've got events as well. I wanted to kind of ask Stevie, uh, myself and Stevie went to the Persia Global Summit. We just came back uh, there. I came back on Saturday, just passed. Stevie, I think you got back on Sunday. Um, and yeah, it's all over. Um, it was four days. Um, what's your, your take on, on the event? The event itself was awesome. It was a little bit of a different vibe from like a, a sponsor like attendee point point of view um just not it just felt a little bit different than than previous conferences but overall like the conference itself and the people and all that really really enjoyed it um the the sessions that i was able to get to uh were really really well done really really good um all the speakers really take that role very very seriously um what when they go there uh which is great and how it should be um but the, the community of people, man, that that's why I go. I, I love the PowerShell community at the PowerShell Summit. Um, just a great group of welcoming folks, super fun to hang out with. And yeah, it, it's a great time. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, this is my first time going since 2018 or 2019. 2019, I think. Um, yeah. Was it 20? I mean, it's been a long time. Um, and I, I did two talks there. Um, one of them was a bit of, it wasn't, I keep saying it's a bit of a disaster. It wasn't. Uh, it was. Video all messed up. You will maybe post the link when it's actually uh, published. That if they haven't fixed it, you can see it. But yeah, I think the, the community it really was a community feel. It was really good. Um, and I got to meet Corey, Tyler, and Ryan for the first time as well, which, uh, you know, while they've worked at Chocolatey for a while, I haven't had the opportunity to meet them, so that was great. And uh, John Janelle as well. I want to call him out again. It was really great meeting him. Hopefully, he watches yeah, that. Yeah, John's a um, good guy. John's a good but yeah, guy. And, and and other people as well. Um, it was great catching up with, with uh, other people. Um, and so I had a really good time, even though I spent a lot of it in the hotel doing my slides. It was I still enjoyed part of it, and I fell asleep and didn't manage to get to the last event. But we'll see how quite. Um, awesome. Okay, so hopefully we'll see what happens next year. But there's also another PowerShell conference, PowerShell Conference Europe uh, 2024. That is June the 24th to the 27th in Antwerp in Belgium. Uh, myself and James Ruskin will be going along to that. So again, if you're going along to that event or you're thinking about it, um, you can find all the details on psconf.eu or, or just search for PowerShell Conference Europe. You'll find that. Um, and stop by the chocolatey booth. Um, we're doing giveaways. I uh, chat with some of the team, me, myself and James. Um, potentially some of the community members as well and uh, pick up some swag as well so that's always good free stuff who says no who can say no uh, okay that's kind of us at the, the end of time today and it brings up something that, that I'd spoke to Gary and Stevie about uh, you know before the, the live stream today and um, we're actually looking to extend the length of the live stream we, we, because we we enjoy talking um, as you probably have. Um, we enjoy talking about these things. We don't often get a lot of opportunity to talk about, you know, technology. We've all been in techn involved in technology for a long time. Um, and, we, you know, we've got views, we've got opinions, and we've got a history and we've got experience there as well um, that we want to kind of share with everybody. So we were going to be looking to extend the recording to 45 to 60 minutes um, and still including the same content, software news, packaging, software deployment, lifecycle management. Um, but kind of early days with, with this um, podcast and live stream format, uh, this being, it's only our third episode. So we're still finding our feet a little bit with the right format and the length of the content, which kind of brings me on to the link that I'm going to pop up on screen again. Let me see if I can find it. It's obviously you never find it when you look for it. Oh, um, this is the link that will allow you to let us know if this format works, if the length of it works. Bear in mind, this is now, we're now being on stream for 45 minutes. Um, so this will probably be the length of the, the content in future, kind of this to 60 minutes, as I said. So please just let us know. Let us know what you think about it. Um, let us know that content producing is what you want to see. Um, is it the right format, right length, as I said? Do you have any ideas about other 
uh, content you'd like to see, just please fill in that survey. As I said it, it, earlier on, it takes 10 seconds. The only thing that's mandatory is just to rate the stream, um, and it's a button, um, or sorry, a slider to drag um, to be able to rate it. And you've got a box to fill out to just to give us some feedback. That is it, basically. It'll take you no more than 10 seconds. Um, and it's really, really appreciated. So please complete that for us. Um, we'd very much appreciate it. Um, also, to ensure that you're notified of all the great content that, from Chocolate Software that we're producing, ensure you join our community hub and Discord. Subscribe to us on YouTube or follow us on Twitter or uh, X. Mastodon, LinkedIn, Facebook, Blue Sky and Twitch. All the details for that are on our website, chocolatey.org. Um, if you scroll all the way to the bottom, you'll see those links there. Um, or in the description of where you found this content as well. Uh, join our next live stream on Twitch or YouTube on Thursday, the 2nd of May, where we'll be going back to basics again. Gary mentioned earlier we went back to basics for the Chocolatey Community uh, you know, chocolate community Repository. We've done Chocolatey CLI. Um, we've uh, done another one, which is totally went out of my head. Stevie, what was the other one? Packages, how to create packages. Yeah, that how to it. create packages, yeah. yeah. Apologies to you and Josh if I just went totally out of my mind. I forgot about that one. Uh, so we're doing another back to basics. We're going to take you through self-service and managing packages as a non-admin within your organization. If you've got anybody in your organization, let's say a finance team, that you want to be able to install their own software, but obviously not give them admin rights on the machine, then uh, this is the, the live stream to, to join. And we'll talk through how that's going to happen and how you can do that with chocolate products, should I say, sorry. Um, so we hope to see you there. Um, thank you for your time today. We really appreciate it. And everybody take care. Bye-bye.